Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Έχουμε την μεγάλη τιμή μας, πραγματικά είναι η μεγάλη μας τιμή, να έχουμε την Dr. Carol Seals μαζί μας σήμερα. Dr. Carol Seals, it's a great honor, uh, honestly, and a great pleasure to have you with us today. Um, I, uh, just give me a few minutes. I would like to talk to my colleagues for your work. Uh, to get to know you a little bit better, and uh, we'll be ready for your talk, which I'm sure is going to amaze us all. Uh, Dr. Carol Seals, λοιπόν, είναι διευθύντρια στο τμήμα της οφθαλμικής ογκολογίας στο Wills Eye Hospital, το οποίο είναι ένα νοσοκομείο και ένα θεσμός λίγο θρηλυκό σε όσους έχουν ασχοληθεί με τον αμφιβληστροειδή. Όποιος θέλει να μάθει καλή ογκολογία πηγαίνει στο Wills. Είναι από τα καλύτερα νοσοκομεία. Είναι καθηγήτρια της οφθαλμολογίας Thomas Jefferson ε, στη Φιλαδέλφια. Ε, έχει τεράστιο συγγραφικό έργο, έχει γράψει πάνω από 1.400 papers και έχει γράψει πάνω από 300 κεφάλαια. Και είναι και στο editorial board πολλών ε, επιστημονικών ε, περιοδικών. Έχει κερδίσει πολλά βραβεία. Τα πέντε σημαντικότερα βραβεία είναι το Dontes Award, το Life Achievement Honor Award από το American Academy of Ophthalmology. Είναι πρόεδρος του International Society of Ocular Oncology και έχει βγει στο Ophthalmology Parallel στο 14-16 ως μία από τους καλύτερους, σημαντικότερους κατόφθαλμιάτρους στο χώρο. Uh, Dr. Shields, we are ready for your lecture. Thank you once more for coming to Greece, even though it is only virtually. Dr. Shields, we are ready to, for your lecture. Thank you. Yes, okay. Um, So the, the screen is not showing my lecture to the... Not to worry, we have time. Mm -hmm. We're waiting for you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm clicking share screen, but my lecture is not coming up. So let me just see. Would you like to log off and log on again? We, we, yeah, we can I, afford time wise, don't worry about it. Okay? Okay. So that's fine. Yeah. So we'll wait for you. Okay. Excellent. Can you see my screen now? Uh, no, it's not shared as yet. Oh, there it is. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So I will begin my talk. I'd like to thank all of you for inviting me to speak to your a Congress of uh, Vitro Retinal Disease. Um, I'd like to also recognize someone who's near and dear to my heart, Dr. Maria Pefkianaki. She's one of the moderators of this session. She did fellowship with us and we've shared many cases over the years. And I think she's a great tribute to Greek ophthalmology and I can foresee that she will be a very strong contributor to the field of ocular oncology And I truly and honestly hope that we can build, maybe in partnership, a wonderful ocular oncology center there in Greece uh, to serve uh, your community. So the title of my talk is Smart Imaging of Choroidal Nevis and How It Works. So let's imagine you enter your office on Monday and you see this pigmented lesion in the right eye of one of your patients. Is this a juxtapapillary nevus? Is that right? And does this orange pigment bother you? Or this very shallow puddle or collection of subretinal fluid? Well, we can image this with autofluorescence. This will show us the orange pigment. And it will also show us the free fluorophores in the puddle of subretinal fluid. And we can also image this nevus with OCT, showing the horizontal cut with shallow subretinal fluid and the vertical cut with inferior subretinal fluid near the foveola. Now, if we look back and are able to find old pictures, 
you'll see that this lesion has actually grown compared to 2009 versus 2014 imaging. There's evidence of growth, there's signs of activity, and this is likely an active melanoma. Now, multimodal imaging has helped us in the identification of choroidal nevus and small choroidal melanoma features, allowing us to identify high-risk features. For example, if you look at these two images, two different patients, pigmented lesions in the choroid, approximately the same size, the one here on the left-hand side is a nevus. It has very chronic features of overlying drusen versus the one on the right-hand side is a melanoma. No features of chronicity, no drusen, but overlying orange pigment and subretinal fluid. Two more pictures, again, a comparison. Same size lesion, pigmented lesion in the choroid. And in the left side, you can see again, overlying RPE atrophy, fibrous PED, and RPE hyperplasia, all signs signifying that this is likely a chronic choroidal nevus. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see there's obvious orange pigment and subretinal fluid. So that's me making a judgment, looking clinically at these images. But we now have very good multimodal imaging and this imaging can help us in identifying high risk nevi at risk for transformation into melanoma. So I ask you four questions. Question number one, does imaging help with identifying choroidal nevus with risk factors for growth to melanoma? And the answer is yes. Question two, are outcomes different based on the various combination of risk factors? And the answer is also yes. Some risk factors are riskier than others. Question three, does choroidal nevus thickness matter? And the answer is yes. The thicker the nevus, the greater the risk for transformation into melanoma. And last question, is the rate of nevus transformation the same or different based on race? And the answer is the same. Now, how do I know that the answers to these four questions? Well, we took each question and studied it in a singular published report. And I will review these reports with you. So in the past, we judged choroidal nevus risk factors using clinical judgment, but now we judge choroidal nevus risk factors using imaging modalities. So going back to our four questions, question number one, does imaging help with identifying choroidal nevus risk factors for growth to melanoma? We answered yes. And this was published in the journal Retina one year ago, 2019. Choroidal nevus imaging features in 3,800 cases and risk factors for transformation into melanoma in 2,300 cases. So we did a major review of a large cohort of choroidal nevi to understand the multivariate factors that predict transformation into melanoma. Imaging was performed in every single case included in this cohort and used in the calculations of risk factors. Now, if we look at that cohort of 3,806 cases, you know, we work in an oncology practice. So we tend to get highly suspicious lesions referred to us. And we found that by one year, 1% 1 of the quote choroidal nevi showed evidence of growth into melanoma. And by five years, 6% showed growth into choroidal melanoma. And by 10 years, the rate was 14% of all choroidal nevi that we followed for 10 years showed growth into melanoma. Now this may be higher than in the general ophthalmologist practice because we get sent very risky lesions, but this allows an enriched cohort so we can identify risk factors that predict growth into melanoma. So we, using multivariate analysis in this cohort, we found six risk factors that predicted growth of nevus into melanoma. 
And we remember these six, six risk factors with a mnemonic, to find small ocular melanoma doing imaging. And each of these letters, T-F-S-O-M, D-I-M, stands for the mnemonic to find small ocular melanoma doing imaging and represents one risk factor. The T represents thickness over two millimeters, F for fluid, S for symptoms of vision loss, O for orange pigment, M for melanoma hollow, and DIM, D-I-M, for a diameter greater than five millimeters. And each is identified not by me guessing if there's orange pigment or guessing if there's subretinal fluid, each is identified without doubt on imaging. So the thickness over two millimeters is identified on ultrasound, fluid on OCT, vision loss on Snell and acuity, orange pigment on autofluorescence, hollowness on ultrasound, and diameter greater than five millimeters by fundus photography. And every one of these risk factors were highly significant with a highly significant p-value. And if you look at the hazard ratio, the number one riskiest factor was thickness over two millimeters, then subretinal fluid, then orange pigment. So if you remember only three points from this lecture, remember thickness over two millimeters, subretinal fluid on OCT, and orange pigment on autofluorescence. That's a bad combination for a pigmented lesion in the eye, highly suggestive of melanoma. So imaging again included Snell and acuity, fundus photography, autofluorescence, ultrasonography, and OCT in every case. Every patient, if we follow the, this, the Nevis once or twice a year, every patient got the imaging at every visit. Okay, cool. So what is the impact of one, two, or even three risk factors? So using Kaplan-Meier analysis, Kaplan-Meier at five years with growth, we found that patients who showed zero factor had only 1% risk for growth, very low risk for growth with no risk factors. But if a patient showed any one risk factor, there was an average of 11% chance for growth within five years and any two risk factors, a 22% rate of growth by five years. And this is where it, it really escalates. Any four risk factors had greater than 50% chance for growth. Hence, if we see a patient with a small lesion, and this only applies to lesions three millimeters in thickness or under, ones that would be called choroidal nevus, perhaps. If we see a patient with a small lesion and there's three or four risk factors, we start talking to that patient about high risk for growth into melanoma, and we tend to treat them promptly rather than waiting for growth. Okay, so let's put this to work and let's score some of these flat lesions, completely thin lesions under two millimeters in thickness. Now, I've, I worked with Dr. Pefki and Aki long enough to know that she could look at this lesion and even without OCT and autofluorescence, judge that this, this is a suspicious lesion. But let's use our risk factors. So this is a small lesion juxtapapillary in the left eye. The base measures four millimeters and the thickness by ultrasound measures 1.4 millimeters. It's not yet two millimeters in thickness but we have three risk factors. We have F for fluid, S for symptoms of vision loss, and O for orange pigment. And if you look at this, we can see there's fluid in the fovea. We don't have a good foveal reflex, but we better see the fluid on OCT. In fact, this fluid is fresh because the photoreceptors look very shaggy. The more chronic subretinal fluid is over a nevus, the more you see photoreceptor retraction. And then if we look at our autofluorescence, we can see kind of a hazy orange pigment. But this lesion's completely flat and it's not hollow on ultrasound. This patient scored three risk factors and that means a 34% Kaplan-Meier five-year rate of growth. This is one that we would seriously talk to this patient 
that this lesion is at moderately high rate or risk for growth into melanoma. Now let's look at this lesion. It's a flat lesion. This was seen in a young 40-year-old woman. She came in, the tumor measured 5.5 millimeters in base and 1.8 millimeters in thickness. And if we look at our six risk factors, thickness, fluid, symptoms of vision loss, orange pigment, melanoma hollow, and diameter greater than five millimeters. She had five of six risk factors. She didn't have the thickness risk factor, but she sure did have subretinal fluid with debris and shaggy photoreceptors and very bright hyper autofluorescence signifying lipofusion, signifying fresh lipofusion and fresh melanoma. And if you look at her ultrasound, this was acoustically hollow. So she had melanoma hollow risk factor and diameter greater than five millimeters. This patient had five of six risk factors with a 55% chance for growth within five years. We did not wait for growth. We treated this promptly with plaque radiotherapy to save her life. So if you look at that second case and look at the uh, orange pigment overlying it, autofluorescence and OCT subretinal fluid, this is before treatment and the bottom panel is after treatment. You can see the subretinal fluid and orange pigment resolved leaving RPE alterations and the subfoveal fluid resolved, leaving flat retina and slight thinning uh, to the uh, temporal retinal region. Okay, question number two, are outcomes different based on various different combinations of risk factors? And as you might estimate, yes, the outcomes differ depending upon what risk factor combination you have. This was published in British Journal of Ophthalmology 2019. Combination of multimodal imaging features, predictive of choroidal nevus, transformation into melanoma. We looked at every different combination of the six risk factors. So we looked at the five-year rate of growth based on one risk factor, and then any combination of two risk factors or three risk factors, et cetera. So if a patient again had no factor, there was a 1% rate of growth. Any one feature showed a mean of 11% rate of growth. Any combination of two factors, a mean of 22% rate of growth. But you can see in this column on the right, rate of growth varied. For example, for patients who had thickness over two millimeters, plus orange pigment, there was a 68% chance for growth within five years. And another high-risk lesion, patients who had symptoms of vision loss plus orange pigment, a 58% rate of growth by five years. If we go further down, we'll see the combination of three factors gave a mean of 34% rate of growth. But if you look at this, patients with thickness over two millimeters, orange pigment, and diameter greater than five millimeters in this large cohort, there were only 20 who fit into that category, but there was a 100% rate of growth in that combination of three. And then if you look at four features, there's a 51% rate of growth, five features, a mean of 55% rate of growth, and nobody had all six features. So these we looked at 63 potential combinations of these risk factors. Then we constructed what, what's called a heat map. And this is a heat map going from cool, conditions that were labeled blue and green versus intermediate, <clears throat> labeled orange, uh, yellow, versus hot or high risk, labeled orange and red. And you can see in this heat map, we have the lowest risk and the highest risk lesions categorized based on cool and hot colors. And we can see that the, some of the highest rate for transformation into melanoma, again, labeled in red, including thickness over two millimeters, orange pigment and hollowness on ultrasound. 
And I'm just gonna highlight some of these labeled in red. And this heat map will be instrumental in the development of artificial intelligence, teaching computers to identify these risk factors and then spitting out an exact percentage rate for those combination of risk factors in the, the development of small melanoma. This is huge for artificial intelligence and we're already working on this here in Philadelphia. So let's look at this case. This is a patient who had a pigmented lesion in the temporal macular region and there's a little bit of orange pigment over it. Now we get our autofluorescence and we can see the scattered orange pigment over it and the puddle of orange pigment below it. That's a sign of activity. And we look at our OCT and we can see there's subretinal fluid, but this fluid is more chronic. This lesion has been followed for quite some time. And we can tell it's chronic because the photoreceptors are all atrophic, retracted. This patient had four risk factors with a 40% rate of growth by five years. And we labeled this as melanoma and we treated this patient with plaque radiotherapy following initial ARA011 nanoparticle therapy, but the tumor grew through the nanoparticle therapy. So we had to treat him with plaque radiotherapy. Here's another lesion. This is a patient with a small pigmented choroidal mass, left eye, suprotemporal to the optic disc. Is it a nevus or a melanoma? Well, if we look, you be the doctor. If we look at the autofluorescence, you can see the overlying orange pigment and the pooled or puddled hyperautofluorescence in the subretinal fluid. And you can see there's obvious subretinal fluid with shaggy photoreceptors. This is a relatively fresh melanoma. This patient had thickness over two millimeters fluid, symptoms of vision loss, orange pigment, and hollowness on ultrasound. This specific combination imparts 100% rate of growth based on our heat map by five years. This patient was treated with plaque radiotherapy promptly with a diagnosis of melanoma. Third question, does choroidal nevus thickness really matter? And we published this in Retina 2019, choroidal nevus transformation into melanoma per millimeter increment in thickness using multimodal imaging in 2000 cases. We just wanted to answer a very simple question. What is the five-year rate of growth for a choroidal nevus that's less than or equal to one millimeter in thickness? And we found the five-year rate of growth for the thinnest choroidal nevus was less than 1%. How about the five-year rate of growth for choroidal nevus that's one to two millimeters in thickness? Well, that came out at 2% 2, 2 chance. So those lesions that are zero to one or one to two millimeters in thickness have a very low rate overall for transformation into melanoma. Once a lesion breaks two millimeters in thickness, the rate escalates. We call this the cutoff or the break point. The, the rate increases for those lesions that are two to three millimeters in thickness, it's a 25% rate of growth over five years. So thickness counts. Greater than two millimeters is an important cutoff where risk escalates. And then the final question, is the rate of nevus transformation the same or different ba based on race? And we published this with Charlotte Morris in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, malignant transformation of choroidal nevus according to race in 3000 patients. Basically, we asked this question, does nevus transformation differ by race? And we found that Caucasians tend to be older at diagnosis more likely female, lower frequency of cutaneous dysplastic nevus, and higher prevalence of skin melanoma. And we found uh, Caucasians versus non-Caucasians. Caucasians had overall a 2% rate of growth into melanoma by five years, and non-Caucasians a 3% rate, but it was not significant. So despite slight dissimilarities in the clinical presenting features of nevus in Caucasians versus non-Caucasians,
the rate of transformation by race doesn't differ. So in answer to these questions, does imaging help? The answer is yes. And we find that ultrasound, OCT, and autofluorescence are very important in qualifying and quantifying choroidal nevus. And then do outcomes differ based on various combinations? Yes. And one of the most serious combinations was thickness over two millimeters on ultrasound fluid on OCT and orange pigment on autofluorescence. And does thickness matter? And the answer is yes, especially if a nevus is over two millimeters in thickness. And does the nevus transformation rate differ by race? And the answer is there's no difference by race. So in conclusion, if you had this lesion, would you want your doctor to say, well, there is a risk for melanoma, but I really don't know what the risk is. And come back in six months and we'll see. It might be bigger. And if it's bigger, we might need to treat it. And you do know that if it gets bigger, the risk for metastatic disease increases. Or would you want your doctor to say, this is a melanocytic tumor with a 34% chance for growth in five years based on three risk factors. Knowing that, we might consider treatment at this point. So remember this mnemonic, to find small ocular melanoma doing imaging. It was just published 2019, uh, a little over one year ago. The T stands for thickness over two millimeters on ultrasound, the F for fluid on OCT, the S for symptoms of vision loss on Snell and Acuity, O for orange pigment on autofluorescence, M for melanoma hollow on ultrasound, and DIM for diameter greater than five millimeters on photography. There's only six factors, but no, early detection of melanoma could save the patient's life. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shields, this was an amazing talk. Thank you very much. It really clarified, at least for me, everything about the NEVI and how we should be following them up. Uh, Maria Pivkanaki, who is an ocular oncologist and has recently, only till recently, was working with you, uh, would like to discuss the questions that the audience has with you, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you once more. Um, hi. hi, Carol. Thank you for your excellent presentation. And um, is Yorgo is an amazing speaker, and uh, sometimes it can be difficult to find the right words to say to someone who means so much to you. And I know very well that you are not only fantastic at your job, but you are a loving, caring person, amazing friend, teacher, leader, a role model for all of, for all of us. Um, so um, I would like one of the questions uh, that audience kindly ask is, um, we know that we are, um, if there are some changes, changes in the neurosensory retina over a small choroidal melanocytic lesion that could suggest a nevus rather, rather than a melanoma with OCTA probably, yeah. yeah. So you, your question is uh, use, using OCTA or yeah, using OCTA? Yeah, yeah, OCTA. Yeah, so we did a study uh, mm -hmm. several years ago on the features of choroidal nevus on, versus melanoma on OCTA. Yeah. And, and we found that uh, both nevus and melanoma tend mm -hmm. to show reduced capillary perfusion in the outer plexiform layer uh, mm -hmm. on both uh, nevus <clears throat> and melanoma. Now, I think the OCT features are even more helpful when mm -hmm. you're judging nevus versus melanoma. Some nevi, you can see subretinal fluid, but mm -hmm. usually we call it a cleft. It's usually chronic subretinal fluid with photoreceptor retraction because of the sick retinal pigment epithelium. The, the nevus does not allow the RPE to pump out fluid and you have a little pocket of fluid over the nevus. We don't consider that active fluid. Active fluid is when you see it with shaggy photoreceptors and it looks active and that's generally seen over melanoma. Whereas nevus, you can sometimes get these little clefts of chronic fluid. Mm -hmm. So it's the quality of how it looks. 
And OCTA has not yet become as important in our judgment of nevus versus melanoma. But, you know, once we start artificial intelligence, I'm sure we will be taught by computers that we're missing something. And um, based on that, uh, do you think that OCTA could uh, differentiate a nevus from hemangioma or melanoma? Uh, do we have any particular uh, visualization of increasing vessels uh, in case of hemangioma or? Yeah, so uh, your, your questions on the differential diagnosis yeah. of choroidal hemangioma from choroidal nevus from choroidal melanoma. Yeah. And yes, OCTA has been studied for choroidal hemangioma, and choroidal hemangioma tends to have, they called it a noodle-like, uh, a noodle-like uh, array of blood vessels in the choroid compared to choroidal nevus, where it shows much reduced perfusion in the choroid. But mm -hmm. our imaging right now of choroidal lesions on OCTA has not yet come become so excellent that we rely on that. So for okay. differenti differentiating hemangioma, choroidal hemangioma from choroidal melanoma, we use ICG I mm -hmm. because ICG totally differentiates the two. ICG for choroidal hemangioma shows bright hypercyanescent by one minute with a washout, whereas with melanoma, it tends to show hypocyanescence with very little uh, leakage on ICG. Okay, thank you so much. One more question. Um, regarding the EDI OCT, uh, we know that we need a minimal high um, for a meaningful um, ultrasound measurement. Uh, do you think that we can have increased um, accuracy of uh, EDI OCT in the lesion shorter than 1.5 millimeter high, or do you don't think so? Yes, I, that's a very good point. Thank um, you. It is a bit, I think it's a little bit old fashioned that we still measure choroidal nevi with ultrasonography. That's been the standard of care for 40 years now, 50 years now. Um, I foresee that the future will be, you know, I foresee that the future is going to be whole eye OCT. We mm -hmm. can already image the anterior segment, we can image the posterior segment with swept source, we can go, you know, 15 millimeters. And I think in the future, we're going to have whole eye OCT and we are going to be measuring lesions in the eye by OCT. And I think it's going to be much, much more accurate than ultrasonography. Okay. Good point. Thank you. And, and one last question. And um, do you think that um, on the OCTA, uh, do we have um, particular um, uh, vascular loops or networks that can relate to the metastasis, to the choroidal metastasis, or we don't see any particular um, vascularizations in case of metastasis? Yes. So I think that would be uh, an outstanding project to look at, to look at the variations of uh, internal vascularity with, on OCTA within metastatic disease versus hemangioma versus uh, melanoma. And I think Right now, again, I think the level of expertise with OCTA is not quite there to mm -hmm. the point that we can rely on it to show us uh, precise vascularity within choroidal lesions, but it's, it's almost there. And I, I suspect we're going to be seeing reports on this. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Pafkinaki. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your lecture and your time. So I think it's uh, morning there. We should leave you to your patience. Oh, <laughs> I, we appreciate how precious the, your time is. Thank you very I, much for coming. I just have to say, I've been talking to Dr. Maria for many years about having coming to a meeting in you have Greece. To come and never, next did I, never did I I promise think. the next time you will be here. <laughs> so fingers we fingers a, crossed, I, we'll see could, you. Yeah. If I could just up. make one last comment, we have a fellow with us from Turkey, and I asked her, where are the nicest beaches in the Mediterranean? And she said, in Greece. Ah, oh. <laughs> excellent. Yeah. Excellent okay. close anyway, up for the day. Thank you, thank you, so you very much. Thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you for asking me. Great honor. Great honor.